Yes, and this is 49ers Talk brought to you by Big O Tires and Jennifer. Here we yeah. are. Uh, just yeah. we're, we're within what three weeks now of the opening of training camp for the 49ers, a rookies report July 18th, followed by the veterans on July 25th. And yes, we're going to be talking about players who face make or break seasons. But you know what? This guy does not face a make or break season, but we're getting closer, I guess, to Nick Bosa time. Uh, you know, we haven't heard anything. Don't know if they're close, if they're far, how much they're talking, if they're talking. But we do know that always deadlines spur action. And I would say, you know, the first deadline for Nick Bosa getting that massive contract extension is coming out. And wouldn't you say no news is good news? I mean, we haven't heard anything out of either side which is very different from what happened last year when Debo Samuel was working on his contract extension, that whole turmoil that happened that set himself up for not the best season, as he explained to us in his last media availability. I think the fact that there is no news is fine. I think it's going to be taken care of. No doubt. Nick Bose is going to be a 49er for a long time to come. And it's just like you said, it's going to happen closer to when the guys are poor. I would bet that sides are talking at least preliminary talks, as of right now, I mean, they're going to have to work a lot of things out. And I always think it's interesting how it's the money is what the money is, but it's the little key pieces in contracts like workout bonuses, injury clauses, trade clauses, all those little things are really what get contracts hung up. They know they're going to have to pay Nick Bosa as the highest paid defensive player in the NFL. It's going to happen. You think you will? Like for sure. Over, I see, I think there's some wiggle room. I think there's where, some wiggle room. Yeah. Where, where the 40 hours could say, boy, you know, Nick, we love you. You're great. But man, I don't know if we can go higher than Aaron Donald. You know, there might be some of that. It'll be close. I but think I think it'll, it'll be, be really close. close. I, yeah. Really close either way. We're, you're looking at that $30 million range, mm -hmm. give or take right there, you know, 30, whatever, 30, 31, you know, something like that per year. Then it's a matter of like the guaranteed money, you know, like, you know, we could probably sketch out on a napkin with a pretty close range of, of what he's going to get as far as years and, and money per years. But in a lot of ways, you know, the, the it's in the details, right? It's, it's how much of that is fully guaranteed uh, you know, all the triggers and everything else that, that could, that could hit, you know, as far as how they want to structure that deal. So I, I, I think that there's no reason to panic. And uh, even if it's not done on July 25th, I don't think there's any reason to panic. I think the first time, you know, that the 40 hours get on the field, and especially the first time that there's pads on the field, I think now that's when, you know, they, they got to start ramping it up because I don't expect Nick Bosa to get on the field and practice without a new contract. I don't think Nick Bosa would want to. I don't think his representation would want him to. And I don't think the 40 hours would want him out there anyway uh, without a new contract. So that's, he, I guess, the one yeah, thing kind of hanging over this team right now. And he's one of the guys that Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch, the entire coaching staff at the 49ers, they don't have any problem or any worry that Nick Bosa is going to be in shape and ready to go for week one. So having him on the field, they're not worried about it yeah. at all. Okay, so you did. This is uh, this episode. We're going to talk about players who face make or break seasons. And you mentioned Debo Samuel. Yeah. And you know, um, I, I think there's a little bit of nuance involved here. I don't think this is a make or break season for Debo Samuel, but I do believe that he kind of put himself on notice when he talked about, you know, how he wasn't prepared physically to play last season that his mind kind of wandered in the off season and, or yeah, last season, uh, you know, I think there was that carryover effect, right. That he talked about right. all the right. stuff that happened during the season, the requesting of the trade, the contract situation, the strange unhappiness with the organization. And, and ultimately when he signed his new deal, a contract that he was very happy with, he wasn't, he didn't put himself in position to, to go out there and carry over his dominance of 2021 into 2022. So I don't know that it's a make or break season for him, but I think there's a lot of pressure on him. And I think a lot of eyeballs are going to be on him to see if he can get back to the 2021 form. 
Absolutely. If he doesn't perform what he's worth, I mean, like if he doesn't reach, you know, if he doesn't reach his potential, what are the chances that the 49ers keep Brandon Ayuk and maybe Debo Samuel is on the trade block? His contract numbers go up a lot next year. So this is the la- like the last year where his contract numbers are not huge. Next season, he goes up to almost $21 million. Yeah. It's a huge cap hit for the 49ers. So if he doesn't reach his full potential and Brandon and Ayuk has this monster season, who's to say the 49ers don't trade Debo Samuel and keep Brandon Ayuk and give him a big extension. And you know that teams around the league are always looking for a guy who's very talented, versatile. Debo Samuel is that. So if he doesn't stay with the 49ers, there's a lot of teams who would be willing to trade and pay him his money, what he has on his contract and in other organizations. So, you know, while it's not a make or break for his NFL career, it might be make or break for his stay with the 49ers. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, I, if the 40, you know, if the 49ers trade him, some team's going to take on that, that, that money. And you talk about the $21 million, which isn't a big deal. I don't think for any team taking that on because that's where, you know, they could look at it as, well, it's $21 million, but they can, they can restructure it in a way where they can spread out the hit over a number of years or whatever. Um, the, the reason the 49ers can conceivably afford both Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk is because you know, they're not paying much for the quarterback situation. And I guess we'll, we'll talk about the quarterbacks a little bit later in this make or break episode. We're going to talk about quarterbacks. Why would we, we ever are. do that? Here, here's the twist though, Jennifer, <laughs> usually we come out of the gates just going all in on quarterbacks and we're starting from from zero to a hundred it's all quarterbacks this one we're just going to pump the brakes a little bit and we'll we'll talk about quarterbacks in the second part of this but if if Brock Purdy is the guy after this season then they have him for another year on a very low level contract which means that they could afford both Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel. The, the, the thing with Samuel's contract for next year, 2024, is that let's just say, you know, hypothetically, he doesn't play well. They're, they say, oh, you know what? It's run its course. They would save $2 million by releasing him or, or trading him or whatever. But um, if they were to release him, he would take on like $26 million, nearly you know, $26.5 million of dead money. So he would account for a lot of their salary cap, but the overall savings would be a lot. Basically, what I'm saying is what you mentioned, like his, his price tag goes up dramatically. So he would cost, you know, either way, if he's with the team, it, well, if he's with if he's not on the team, he's gonna take up a lot of cap money. If he's on the team, he's like the first guy that they're going to go to to restructure, to do a conversion in order to create salary cap room. But yeah, just talking about Debo Samuel, you know, he missed four games last year. The the probably the most notable drop off was just the yards receiving, where he went from fourteen hundred and five yards receiving to six thirty two. But even within that. He averaged 18.2 yards per reception in 2021. And last season, that dropped off nearly seven yards per catch to 11.3. So, you know, when you when you talk about, or not when you talk about, but when he talks about, you know, not being in the best physical condition, that's probably where it shows up the most, was the average yards per reception dropped by nearly seven yards. And so he's got to get that back up there. It doesn't have to be 18. He may never reach 18 again, but it can't be 11.3. That's for darn sure. Now he did post on social media, some of his workouts and he was on one of those sloped curved treadmills and he reached up to 18.9 miles per hour. So he is training very hard. He's setting some up himself up for a success in 2023. So it just remains to be seen if he shows up on the field. Yes. Okay. So here's another guy who needs to show up on the field and needs to contribute to this team. And uh, we're talking about make or break guys, you know, guys who face make or break seasons. And I think the number one guy on the list is Javon Kinlaw. 
the 49ers already turned down the fifth year option, which means he is now in his contract year. It's his fourth season with the team. You know, they, he came over in that trade. They, they picked up a, a draft pick first round draft pick when they traded DeForest Buckner to the Colts, they moved back one spot and they get Javon Kinlaw. And, you know, he, he just hasn't been able to, to stay on the field, you know, get on the field, stay on the field. He's only played 10 of the past 34 regular season games due to that, the knee condition. Um, by all accounts, you know, he's as healthy as he's been since he's been with the 49ers. Of course, we heard the same thing last year at this time as well. But the past two seasons, 12 tackles, no sacks, one quarterback pressure, and I think he's going to be hard pressed, you know, regardless of how he plays. And the team went out and got Javon Hargrave to come in and basically take his spot as a starter. I think almost regardless of how well he plays, because of his history, it's going to be difficult for him to get a multi-year contract. But you know, if he if he plays well, then he'll get a he'll get a good contract. But if he if he's injured again, if he doesn't start to show something, it's going to be a one-year contract for, you know, a minimum. And some teams might not even have him on their free agent board because of the injury concerns and the risk that they would take if they were to sign him. Yeah, unlike Debo Samuel, this is a make or break season for Javon Kinlaw's NFL career. So if he plays really well, he'll play himself into a nice contract, a decent one. It might only be one or two years, but he's young still. So if he can show production, if he can show that, you know, because he's healthier, that he can actually perform on the field, it can propel him forward. And, you know, it might not be with the 49ers. I doubt it will be, but getting back onto the field for him means a longer future in the NFL. And it's, I mean, it's so hard for players to, you know, extend their careers. This is, this is a big step for him contract year. He needs to show what he can do, how much he's improved. And you look at the guys that have come out of Chris Kacarek's group. He's one that hasn't done as much. And he, you know, Chris Kacarek is very successful in, getting guys performing, reaching their potential. So this is his last chance really with this team, with Chris Kacarek to become the player that everybody thought he could be, the potential that they had, you know, in their minds when they drafted him so early. This is the time where he's going to have to prove himself, prove his worth on the field. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about him is, you know, no one has been, more disappointed in the first three seasons of his career than, than him. And it's because of the, the physical ailments, you know, the, the stuff that you just, you know, it's part of the game. Um, some guys deal with this, other guys don't, but you know, part of the reason why he hasn't been productive on the field when he gets on the field is because he hasn't had an opportunity to practice as much as the other guys and to play and to figure things out. And so, yeah, this is a huge season for him. And the 49ers are beyond the point where they're counting on him to be, you know, some superstar, some all pro at this point, you know, with Eric Armstead lining up at one defensive tackle spot with Javon Hargrave at the other defensive tackle spot, they just need a role player. You know, they just need somebody who can go in there and eat up snaps and be a good player, you know, kind of out of that, you know, completely different playing style as uh, Kevin Givens, but somebody like that who can just go in there. If you need him to play 30 snaps, you don't have to worry about him. If you only need him to play 20, that's fine too. But just whenever he's on the field, there cannot be, you know, a noticeable drop off. And, you know, being in this role where he's not going to be a starter, he, he might benefit from that because he can just go all out for a limited number of snaps, whereas, you know, he doesn't have to play a full game. And I want to be clear, it's not for lack of effort on Javon Kinlaw's part. He's done everything he can to get healthy, to practice and be on the field as much as possible. But you look at his rookie year. I mean, he wasn't given the best opportunity. Rookie year, COVID year, 
He didn't get to train during the off season. He didn't have training camp. He basically went from working out in the backyard, kind of doing farm workouts to going right into his rookie season and then having knee issues and whatnot, you know that every player that's out there wants to be as successful as possible. It's not for lack of effort or for lack of trying, but he's just been, you know, dealt not the best hand of cards. So it is a big year for Javon Kinlaw. Yeah. A couple of other defensive linemen that I know uh, are on your radar as far as the, the make or break. And I, you know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't consider this a make or break year for Drake Jackson. It's only a second year. Um, you know, I think they want to see an incremental improvement and, you know, be able to have himself conditioned to last the entire season. But I guess it could be in the sense that what he shows this season will give the 49ers a very big indication of whether he is the long-term guy who will start at the other defensive end spot opposite of Bosa or whether the off season or maybe even during the season, they have to go looking for somebody else. So I don't think it's, it's certainly not make or break, but maybe for the team, it will give them kind of a roadmap of what they can expect from Drake Jackson going forward. And the 49ers, I think, have been really looking for that opposite player, that player that goes opposite of Nick Bosa. You look at what they did with D Ford. I mean, they really wanted a bookend. I think that would make the defensive line kind of return back to that 2019 level. When D Ford was healthy, that defensive line was really powerful, really dominating on the field. So they've been looking for that. It hasn't really happened with Samson Ebukam, with Charles Amenahu. Those guys were productive, but not as much as they wanted to. I mean, they spent a lot of money on D Ford to get that same, to get that balanced defensive line. They're hoping that Drake Jackson is the answer on the other side. You know, it's funny. I mean, John Lynch has said this a couple of times now. And the first time he said it, it kind of, you know, perked my ears up a little bit when he talked about how when they did the deep dive after the season and what they did was, you know, all the offensive coaches, you know, well, coaches graded their own units and and went through it with a fine tooth comb and all that. But they also did this exercise where the offensive coaches looked at the defense and gave their honest assessments as well as the defensive coaches looked at the 49ers offense and gave their honest assessments. And the thing that John Lynch has mentioned a couple times now is that it came back to the defensive line. I mean, he basically said that they evaluated the defensive line as being the weakness of the team. You know, he didn't say it in those terms, but he did say they kept coming back to the defensive line, not being as dominant as they wanted it to be. And that's well, crazy, right? Because a little you, bit. I mean, yeah. You look at the defensive stats that they've had for several years yeah. coming and it's been. But I, tough. but I also completely understand. I kind of felt, I think I, I said a lot last year that I felt like the defensive line was overrated, that it wasn't as good as, I don't know. It, it just wasn't as good as public perception because it was basically, it was Nick Bosa. And I mean, who else last year? Right. That was it, right? I mean, it was Nick Bosa. Uh, when Armstead was out there, especially in the playoffs, he was really good. But none of the other guys were, I mean, everybody else was either right. average, you know, slightly above average, slightly below average. But they didn't average. dominate. They didn't dominate the line of scrimmage. They didn't. I mean, I think that the strength of the team was that they had a bunch of guys who played hard and played you know, and we're high motor guys who, you know, who got out there, they played a limited number of snaps, um, you know, other, like I said, other than, than Bosa and, and when Arm said was healthy, he, he was a workhorse. He's out there playing a lot, but there was this, there, there just wasn't a whole lot of star power. Uh, and now, you know, Javon Hargrave coming in gives them a little bit more star power. Um, but they bring in a guy like Cleland Farrell. And I guess, when you look at the guys they brought in, they lost some of those guys you mentioned, Samson Ebicom, Charles Aminahu, Jordan Willis, you know, not, you know, guys who did a good job. I wouldn't say they, they certainly didn't do great jobs, but they did good jobs, good role players. And I just wonder if, 
a guy like Cleveland Farrell coming in, who was a high draft pick, came in this league with a lot of fanfare and a lot of expectations, and that never materialized with the Raiders. Um, I guess they're expecting him to kind of fall into that line of players that they've had, you know, a guy like uh, Arden Key, for instance, or Ebukam, or um, heck, Willis and um, Aminahu, those guys who can step in and either set himself up for a long term with the 49ers or play well enough in this year, this season, that he gets a big money contract somewhere else next year. So in other words, he comes in and he he uh, earns his money and helps the team in the process. Right. Cleveland Farrell has really nothing to lose. It's a one-year deal for $2.5 million. This can propel him to a multi-year contract in the future, just like Arden Key. They're very similar. They even wear the same number. Um, he's wearing the same number that Arden Key had when he was with the 49ers, 94. So um, really interesting that he could really propel himself into a multi-year contract going forward. I think he's got a lot of potential. And it's interesting that he also, like Arden Key, was with the Raiders. I don't know if he wasn't used to his full potential, but I, I feel like it's going to be the same type of path where Chris Kassarek sees the potential in a guy, is able to get way more out of him, and then he's able to bounce out. And if it's not with the 49ers, it's with another team getting a big money contract. Because you look at the talent level that he is, obviously, if you go in the first round in the top 10 picks, there's talent there. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he just wasn't used correctly with the Raiders. I didn't watch a ton of Raiders games last year or the year before. So I just think that this is a make or break season for his NFL career. If he doesn't do well, it'll only be one year deal for him. Going yeah. I, I think probably with him, it, it's similar to like uh, Solomon Thomas. Whereas you know, Solomon Thomas, as I recall, I remember that draft that he was in and I remember I was with some, I forget if you were there or not, but I was with a couple of other reporters and Vic Fangio came in and Vic Fangio said, Hey, Stanford's going to have a top 10 defensive player. He said like, when's the last time Stanford's had a top 10 defensive player in the draft. And I forget, I think I, I've, now you know, years have gone by, I forget who it, who the, the top Stanford defensive player has been drafted, but he said, one's going to be there this year. One's going to be in the top 10 this year, and that's Solomon Thomas. So it wasn't like the 49ers were the only team that saw Solomon Thomas as a top. Maybe they were the only team that saw him as a top three pick. Um, but he was, that's not crazy where they drafted him. But then you watch Solomon and you go, hey, he's, he's a good player. You know, he, whatever, he's an average player. There's no, I mean, there was no, nothing that showed that he was a, should have been a top 10 pick. So I'm assuming that means like the NFL over you know whatever over um, evaluated him cleland farrell maybe the same way um but then you started to see you know some of the mocks from people who are in the know and talk to nfl teams they had him drafted much later in that first round the other thing with farrell was you know whether he was drafted above where he should have been that's open for debate but the one thing that isn't open for debate is the coaching staff and the guys who drafted Farrell, they they're gone. And so new coaches, new, you know, front office. And so a lot of times the guy isn't able to develop like you'd want him to because he doesn't have that support system in the building that's kind of pushing him along or giving him those opportunities. And you look at Solomon Thomas, too. They asked him to do several different things. We don't know what Cleveland Farrell was asked to do. You know, Solomon Thomas was asked to go inside, then outside. I mean, it wasn't always the, the same task that he was asked to do on the field. Who knows whether it's the same thing for Cleveland Farrell. But if he follows the same path as Arden Key, it could be you know, a great pick, a great kind of steal for the 49ers. Yeah, it's kind of a make or break year for him, right? I mean, yep. he, he didn't do much with the Raiders in his seasons there. Um, and so now coming to the 40 hours, it's, it's probably more make or break than, than just about anyone, because I think other teams will look at it and go, well, if he doesn't perform well with the 49ers, then why would we think he'd perform well with us? Um, another guy on defense, 
third round draft pick in 2021, Ambry Thomas. And you know, he's in a little bit more of a difficult situation to prove himself because he is not going to be a starter unless there are some injuries. So he's basically just trying to put himself in position where if something were to happen or uh, you know, something were to happen to the starters, Charverius Ward or Diameter Lenore, that he can step in and, and show some of the things he showed late in that 2021 season. Last year, he was a, a backup who rarely got on the field at all. But I guess also he needs to show that he's in that next group of cornerbacks. You know that he can he can beat out or compete with Darrell Luter, with Sam Womack, and with some of the other cornerbacks who are in there for not necessarily a starting job because those seem to be pretty wired right now, but definitely to be the number three corner and at the very worst the number four corner. This is one of those situations where Amory Thomas is going to have to make every snap on the field count because he's not going to get that many opportunities. So if it's during preseason, if it's during, you know, whenever he can get in for different setups, if, you know, when the defense calls for him to be on the field, he's going to make sure that he does exactly what he's supposed to do, that he doesn't, you know, plays relatively mistake free because that's going to set him up for his future. It's going to be, it's been a tough, road for him you know he started out really hot in his rookie year playing a lot of snaps and then kind of fell off the the radar this is his chance he I'm sure he realizes there's pressure on him because again going through it's his going to be you know his third season yeah it's his third season so it's not necessarily like completely make or break his NFL career but this is going to be his chance to really prove that he has what it takes to have a career in the NFL Jennifer this could be a make or break season for me. I think, I think uh, <laughs> if I'm going to make it to 30 on the 49ers beat uh, <laughs> year 29, I, I need to show that I, I haven't lost. Well, I've lost a few steps along the way, but maybe <laughs> now that I'm, I'm wily and I've lost a few steps, maybe I can make it up for it in anticipation or other, other skills like that. Technique, just like with Richard Sherman, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Technique. <laughs> <laughs> reinvent myself, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So we talked a lot about the defense uh, in the first segment, and now let's switch over to the offensive side of the ball, make or break. And yes, we will be talking about a couple of notable quarterbacks, but I guess the number one guy, um, when I think about on offense, make or break third round draft pick from 2022. He played in 13 games as a rookie, but he was only targeted seven times, had only one catch for 10 yards and just did not look comfortable as a rookie uh, breaking in as a wide receiver in this offense. And that's Danny Gray. The one thing for sure that he has going for him is that elite speed but I would say with a guy like Ronnie Bell of Michigan coming in, seventh round draft pick, and just the early returns on Ronnie Bell were, were very encouraging for the 49ers. He's played a lot of football and it shows. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's some pressure on Danny Gray because I, I don't think that we can sit here right now and just say that his spot on the team is a given. No, and the fact that they brought him in really to be that guy who stretches the field for Trey Lance's arm strength if they don't have Trey Lance under center how important is he yes you always need someone to stretch the field but Brock Purdy's kind of like sweet spot is you know 15 to 20 yards Danny Gray was really brought in to stretch the field 25 and further Brock Purdy right at 20 that's his sweet spot where he really is on target Danny Ray's got to show that he can do more than just stretch the field. He's got to be able to be decisive in his routes, get separation, do all the right things on the field because we've seen him line up and not know exactly what's going on. And granted, Kyle Shanahan's offensive system is not the easiest for guys to get under in their heads, but to not know what you're doing on the field or to be lined up incorrectly or run the wrong route, that does not make you a guy who Kyle Shanahan is going to have patience with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kyle Shanahan's really tough on his wide receivers. I think he's toughest on that position in particular. And for Danny Gray to not have all of his stuff dialed 
is going to make it really tough for Kyle Shanahan to say, yes, we're going to keep him around and give him another chance. Yeah. I mean, he's, I, I think he's probably the fastest guy. I think he's, I think uh, Leonard Hankerson said that on a previous 40 years podcast. He's the fastest guy in that room. And, you know, the ability to go deep, um, you know, make the safety go over there, open this up stuff in the middle for, you know, Kittle for Debo Samuel for Brandon Ayuk for everybody, um, and so there that he does have value, but yeah, he's got to be able to do more than just that. He's got to be able to do more than just line up outside the numbers and run a nine route down the field. So yeah, a little bit of pressure on Danny Gray. Is it a make or break year? Yeah, kind of might be. Uh, let's see here. Should we just go straight for the uh, for the quarterback talk at this point? Quarterbacks, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's. I think we've. I, I think we've treaded water long enough. <laughs> so there's, there's the first guy that came to my mind as far as the quarterbacks make or break. I think it might be different than the quarterback who came to your mind. Should we say our our number one make or break quarterback at the same time? Let's do it. Okay. Three, two, one. Trey Lance. <laughs> Hold on. Who'd you say? I said Sam Darnold. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess, I mean, you can make an argument for both of them, which right. obviously we can. Um, I, I just think with, you know, just to talk about Trey Lance for a second here, I mean, the four years invested so much to go up and get him. What does that mean now? It means absolutely nothing. But what does mean something is that he showed in the off season better than he has since he's been with the team. And I've gotten the sense for several months that the 49ers really like where he is. All that said, you know, they like how he is mentally. They like how he is physically. All that said, there are just still so many unanswered questions about what he can bring to the table because of one reason. He simply has not played a lot of football since his senior year at Marshall High. And that was a long time ago. It was. And so I think that, you know, he may never get his chance with the 49ers if Brock Purdy gets healthy, stays healthy, and performs well. But what he can do, the make or break part for him very well might be in the first two weeks of training camp where he's getting those extended reps, not against a defense that he knows, uh, but against the Raiders defense and just proving that he is spot on with his thought process and also can deliver the football to open receivers. So that's why I think that this is make or break time for Trey Lance. As much as the team likes him, um, let's face it. I mean, this is a this is a tough, brutal business and he's a commodity. And so if he can't win the number two job, then the team's going to have some very difficult decisions to make, made all the more so because you have Brandon Allen, who's been a number two in this league. And so the team will have to determine if, you know, how much longer they stay with Trey Lance, even though they may like him, how much longer can they stay with him? Or does it make more sense to try to get something for him? Also, the end of the season, they have to make a determination whether to pick up the fifth year option, just like they turned it down with Javon Kinlaw. You know, right now, if he doesn't get on the field, they're not picking up that fifth year option. So that's why I think it's a make or break year for Trey Lance. But you say Sam Darnold, and I, I mean, that's kind of, I think we can all figure out why, but tell me why you, you went with Sam Darnold over Trey Lance for make or break season. You look at Sam Darnold, where he's been, what he's been able to do, and the struggles that he's had. He's got a one-year deal, $4.5 million. This is his chance to show that he can thrive in a different system, where he has every opportunity to be in a, an offensive system that maybe makes more sense for him. And just like Trey Lance, I think it's going to be very important that when they have those scrimmages against the Raiders, that he plays really well because all eyes are going to be on both Trey Lance and Sam Darnold. I really think both of them, it's make or break for both. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you know, very little 
between the two of them, uh, which has more make or break potential. I think both of them have to play really well in those training camp weeks, the, especially against the Raiders, because it's going to be televised. It's mm-hmm. going to be all the coaches on and people are going to be watching the film of the scrimmages. Both. Well, it'll be televised. It'll be well, filmed. Well, or... the, the scrimmage will be, I mean, the, the preseason game will be televised. Yeah. I just don't think the pre, I think people make way too much of the preseason games. I, I just don't think that I think there, I don't think there's, if, I don't think the coaching staff's opinion of either quarterback will be swayed by just the limited number of snaps True. in a preseason right. game. I think those no, practices definitely more scrimmages are definitely. huge mm-hmm. because they can actually script out stuff and in, in essence kind of put the players in a position to fail in the sense that, or, or maybe not, but maybe that's wrong way to word it, but put them in challenging positions and then see how they respond. Right. So I agree with you there too, but both quarterbacks are going to have their opportunity to show what they're capable of, whether, you know, how does that affect their future for Trey Lance? It's with the 49ers or just his NFL career, Sam Donald, he's got one year to show that he can adapt to a challenging offensive system with players around him for the first time that are, you know, High, a, a really nice supporting cast for him to play with. So how both of those quarterbacks play and respond to the pressure on them in the preseason it has a big impact on both their futures. What's going to happen down the road, whether, you know, who's the number two spot on the quarterback depth chart. Yeah. It's a big training camp for both quarterbacks. So I, I said that Trey Lance was my guy, but I it, here's why I would, also say that that your argument for uh, Sam Darnold is very strong. Um, Trey Lance is still 23 years old. If it doesn't work out for the 49ers, he's going to get another opportunity because I guarantee you there were teams out there that coming out of the draft loved Trey Lance and you haven't heard a bad word about Trey Lance coming out of the 49ers. And so he will get another opportunity somewhere and right, because it, it, the reason he hasn't been on the field is injury. It's not yeah. that he hasn't worked hard. It's not that he hasn't been able to take advantage of his opportunities. He hasn't been able to get on the field because he's been injured. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, w- when he's been on the field and we've seen on the practice field, you know, it hasn't been perfect. You know, it's, it's, there's, he, there's some issues that he's been working to address as far as, you know, just throwing the football mechanics and all that. And a lot of that had to do with that, the finger, which changed his throwing motion, but he's 23 years old. He's a long way from the end of the line for his football career. Um, but Sam Darnold, he's not old either, but he is 26. And he's been in the league for a long time. And we talked about how Trey Lance just doesn't have much. Uh, he just doesn't have you know much experience at all. I mean, Sam Darnold has 55 NFL starts. So if if he shows well... And whether Brock Purdy is the guy or not for the long term, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Sam Darnold might end up getting another starting opportunity somewhere down the road. In fact, it's it's completely within the realm of possibility that if both Sam Darnold and Trey Lance have a good training camp, and all the reports are strong. Well, one of them is probably going to be the backup, but both of them could also be putting themselves into position to be a starter somewhere down the road. So yeah, it is, it's, it's more probably it's more urgent right now for Sam Darnold because of his age and because of his failed experiences, both, both with the jets and then kind of a mixed bag with the Panthers and now coming into the 49ers where quarterbacks have generally, you know, succeeded. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic and it's, you know, it, it will be, even though it's by and large for the backup position, it, it will be the most interesting competition without question on the roster this season, because they both entered the, NFL as number three overall pick. So they're both blessed with a wealth of talent. Darnold with another team, Trey Lance with the 49ers. But it sure seems to me like right now, 
with training camp set to open, you know, like uh, rookies and quarterbacks probably report the, the 18th, they, they come to camp basically on equal footing. Right. Now, don't you think if Sam Darnold doesn't do well in Kyle Shanahan's system and granted it will be during training camp and those scrimmages against the Raiders that, I mean, his potential to go somewhere else, where it, does it leave him? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, if if he doesn't make the team, you know, does he end up somewhere as a backup, or is he on a practice squad, or is he a number three? Yeah, I mean, I guess the same could be said for for Trey Lance, and and then where does Brandon Allen fit into this whole equation? So yeah, it it's going to be interesting. A lot of guys with make or break seasons. Hey, uh, Jennifer, I did like give um you know this whole threads thing the new social media i uh, one of my first posts on threads was uh that we we were going to have this podcast uh talking about make or break season so i asked some folks uh, there who their make or break people were a couple of people said ty davis price and um you know someone said elijah mitchell uh steph 49k said ty davis price and i don't know that i would necessarily put him in in make or break because i think his opportunities as you know the number three or number four running back you know i don't know that he's going to have a huge opportunity i mean he would have to be spectacular to be the number two guy Mm -hmm. He'd have to be pretty darn good also to be the number three guy. I just think he has a little bit more time. And then uh swing tackle Jalen Moore was another guy that, that somebody brought up. Let's see who brought him up. Uh, it was also Steph 49 K. Uh, the, the one thing about Elijah Mitchell to me, this is a make or break season for Elijah Mitchell to see if he can stay healthy for an entire season. Yeah. But do you think that it's make or break in the sense that he won't be back next year? No, I don't think that, but I mean, like, I think, if he can stay healthy for an entire season, I think that helps his potential yeah. for, you know, a future contract. Is anyone going to take a, a chance on him having a multi-year deal if he can't stay healthy for another season? Yeah. I just think, boy, I, you know, this is maybe a topic for another podcast, but running backs. Whoa. I mean, mamas don't let your babies grow up to be running backs. Yes. I mean, that is just a rough position it's the only position where the better you are one year does not set you up for a better situation the next because yeah. it's right. I mean, it's almost like teams say, oh, wow, yeah, he rushed for 1500 yards, but man, all that wear and tear on your body, uh, boy, we're not going to give him a big contract because he's going to break down. So it's it's a tough racket to be um, a running back. And the position is completely undervalued. However, we did see a couple of first round draft picks this year. And also, you know, we just saw last year how much a running back can impact a team. I mean, the 49ers, you know, what, however you want to slice and dice the 49ers 2022 season, you know, whether it was, you know, once Purdy took over or when Jimmy started getting, you know, whatever, right. But the 49ers took off when Christian McCaffrey got on the field. And so he made a, a huge impact on this team. And, and now the 49ers running back situation seems pretty, pretty loaded with McCaffrey, with Elijah Mitchell, with Jordan Mason and with Ty Davis price. So those are four, I think, pretty good running backs. Yeah. Interesting. So, but is Christian McCaffrey, is he a one-of-one? -one? Is he, because he can do so much on the field or, you know, because he can be a receiver, because he can be a running back, he can do so many different things on the field. Does that make him, is he one of a kind in that way? Uh, yeah, I, well, I think when you look at the running backs who, that teams valued in the draft, mm -hmm. those are the running backs who are not just, you know, line up, you know, eight yards behind the line of scrimmage and just run downhill. I mean, they're guys who are, good in the running game, good in the passing game. So I, I do think that that position, you know, see the old, the, the Roger Craig thing, right? I mean, um, you know, the thousand thousand guy, I don't know if that's ever going to happen again. It might. Um, I'm just thinking about teams probably don't want to have the wear and tear on their running backs like that, but also um, 
having that ability. You know, if they need a a 1200 yard rusher, he would be the guy. If they need a guy who can catch whatever 80 passes out of the backfield and maybe, you know, get a uh, thousand yards receiving, he could be the guy. So I think th- those versatile running backs like Christian McCaffrey, which, and I think Elijah Mitchell is kind of in that same vein. We haven't seen it that much as far as him catching passes, but I kind of think that when they, when they selected him, that was what they had in mind. And now they have, you know, the real deal. One of only 3000, thousand yard guys in NFL history. It's Roger Craig, it's Marshall Falk and it's Christian McCaffrey. Okay, here, here, here's one more. Okay. This uh, this comes from Drew Bridges 42. Um, and he, when I asked about make or break, he mentioned two guys for salary reasons. One we already touched on, Debo Samuel, but he also mentioned Eric Armstead. And, you know, with Eric Armstead, next year would be a year where they, they would get a lot of cap savings if he weren't on the team. And um, I, you know, Certainly, he's not a guy they're looking toward moving at any point because of what he does on the field, but and off the field as well. But you know, I guess if he if, if he's unable to stay healthy, and you start to look at the the big money guys, I mean, they could save a lot of money next year. But um, I mean, I think something dramatic would have to happen for them to even look that far down the road or look at that doing something that dramatic down the road with Eric Armstead. Yeah, I don't see it either, but yeah, you never know. I mean, I think that's the one of the things that's so tough about the league in general is that you players think that their position with the team could be solid fans get attached to those players. And because of the business aspect of the league, you just never know what could happen in the following year. Maybe it's a trade. I mean, I know you as well as I did thought that DeForest Buckner was not going to get traded somewhere else. And he did. So you just, you never can count it. But one thing, like we said at the beginning, I don't think Nick Bosa is going anywhere (laughs) for those fans that are out there that want to buy his Jersey. I would definitely do it. If you have it on your list, I don't think he's going anywhere. There's Um, not much you can count on in NFL Jennifer. (laughs) But I was going to cut you off, or I did cut you off. You were going to say yeah. something else? Yeah. Okay. There's not, okay. So we'll, this is how we're going to end this podcast. Okay. There's not much you can count on in the NFL. One thing you can count on, 49ers talk twice a week, unless we want to do it once a week. One thing, congratulations to Brock Purdy, Jenna Brandt getting engaged. There you go. 